Hi, it's Dr. Baumholtz and Kat. Kat didn't want to be on video for some reason, but she's going to ask some questions and we're going to try to answer it. So uh, you've heard of between two firms. Here's between two people from a plastic surgery office. All right, fire away. These are questions that we've gathered um, either from our social media accounts or um, patients have asked us. Uh, there's some interesting questions. We'll likely chop the video up into different pieces so that it's a little more manageable, but, uh, but here we go. Fire away. Fat graft breast augmentation. Oh, I love this one. Okay, so um, much, uh, just kick the uh, tripod there. Um, much love to Dr. Corey and others who have really pioneered the use of fat grafting for uh, breast and fat grafting in general. I think fat's a great um, solution to a lot of problems. I don't personally love it as a primary means of breast augmentation because it doesn't give a predictable uh, result. Reliable, yes, not predictable, meaning only a certain percentage of the fat that is transferred into the breast or into any body part is still there at a year. Some of the fat cells die off when you transfer them. With an implant, we can reliably predict exactly how much we're giving someone and the change it's going to make for that woman's chest size. It's one operation. Fat grafting can lead to multiple operations, especially if the same percentage of fat doesn't, doesn't die off in each breast. You can end up with asymmetry and you're chasing that. If I've got a small a deficit like following a biopsy or a small asymmetry fat can be a lovely solution for that and i love it great question next how do i know when my breast implants need replacing great so saline implants simple they're either up or they're down so if the implant is ruptured and you've got a flat tire and an extra gatorade meaning your body has absorbed the saline that's in that that's easy no special testing silicone implants um, either by mri or ultrasound can detect a capsule rupture and if the implant itself has ruptured, huh? if the implant itself has ruptured, um, then it's time to replace it. Now, the latest batch of data used to be, by the way, that surgeons would tell patients every 10 years you need new implants. One can only assume that they had uh, boat payments or who knows, I'm being funny. What the research data was designed to do originally was it was done in 10 year increments. So every study that's ever wanted to replicate the original studies were done, oddly enough, in 10 year increments. So we talk in terms of 10 years. The latest batch of data says the majority of women over the course of 10 years, they are the drivers now. They come and they decide uh, what's to be done. It may be that they uh, had smaller implants initially, bye. They had smaller uh, implants initially and now they want larger or they are larger, they wanna go smaller or maybe they need a lift, any number of reasons. But, but the real beauty of it is that the women, um, uh, the patient themselves driving that conversation. Next. How would I find an experienced, trustworthy surgeon around my area? I'm ducking down to see all the certificates. Okay, easiest thing to do. Um, you go to the American Society of Plastic Surgery uh, website, ASPS, and on the top right corner of the page is a find a surgeon um, box and you type in your zip code. And what it will show you is a list of surgeons who are members of ASPS. So by definition, these are board certified plastic surgeons, board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. I think it's that certificate that way. Um, board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgeons who are also members of ASPS, which is one of the um, largest uh, bodies of plastic surgeons uh, in the world, frankly. Um, that really is a good place to begin. Next would come um, either friends or family who have, who have sought care with board certified plastic surgery, uh, plastic surgeons. Um, and then, uh, you know, their online presence, which can be bought and sold, um, but reviews from other patients, and then you can get into before and after galleries, and we can talk about the value of that. But it starts probably the easiest way to begin. If you don't already know somebody, we go to ASPS, find a surgeon, and you'll see a list of surgeons who are board certified in your neck of the woods. What does botched mean in relation to plastic surgery? Yeah, it was a fun show, wasn't it? I think it, it's, it's, it's still, still going, okay. So, um, Generally speaking, it, it's, it's tough to shy away from words that we use in conversation uh, versus ones that have medical legal con um, connotations or medical legal implications, right? So um, a botched surgery uh, can either be something that ended up with a result that, that neither the surgeon nor the patient wanted. It could be a surgery that was ill-conceived from the very beginning. It could be a surgery that was poorly executed, meaning it wasn't, wasn't done well. Um, the vast majority of my practice is, is revision or secondary surgery. I, I do shy away from that, that particular word because I think a lot of times um, the problem, if, if you want to use that word, is not so much the surgeon or the way things were done, but rather a breakdown in communication. Um, the vast majority of times I'll interview patients and then I'll get their charts and their prior 
uh, records, and it just seems to be a disconnect. You know, the patient is saying that they wanted such and such, and the surgeon uh, may or may not have said that they can or can't have that. And so managing expectations is, is for me at least, the most critical way to minimize that experience, that sense of not getting what, what you wanted, because you have to be clear about what you want, and those, those expectations have to be reasonable. Um, we see a lot of uh, patients who, you know, maybe they needed a lift of their breast and instead decided to have a larger implant that rarely gives them what they wanted. Maybe they needed a tummy tuck and instead had liposuction or, or an energy device like cool sculpting that rarely gives them what they want. And so they're frustrated having spent money on, uh, on something and, and it wasn't what they wanted. Maybe they were sold the idea that it would be, uh, but it wasn't. And so that uh, filters into that or factors into that conversation. How'd we do? Did that answer that question? Mm -hmm. All right, on to the next one. Can you reverse plastic surgery? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, the, the only, I tell patients the only thing permanent in this equation are, are the scars, and th those are permanent. Now, um, can you revise? Can you alter? Can you enhance? Can you redo? Yeah, my entire practice, almost my entire practice, is revising uh, prior surgery, often done by, by other surgeons. Um, yes, you're in this business long enough, you get to revise some of your own. Um, but the bottom line is you can never undo a scar. The scar is permanent. Um, just about everything else can be uh, altered in some fashion. The question is, uh, will it be more to the patient's liking uh, in keeping again with a, a reasonable request or will it be uh, further away? But that, that's, that's the not so short answer. What are some of the biggest myths about plastic surgery? Oh, great. Um, social media has been the greatest two-edged sword ever to happen to plastic surgery. On the one hand, it has normalized the conversation about the work that we do. On the other hand, it has created literally a tidal wave of unrealistic expectation. So filters and, and other um, means to cloak the real result has been some of the, the hardest things to overcome. And so I'd say one of the first myths that I would like to tackle is, is managing uh, realistic expectations and where those expectations come from. If they're coming from Instagram or TikTok, um, you may be disappointed with your, with your personal result because that's an unfair comparison, both for you and for the surgeon that you choose to work with. At the end of the day, um, we see people that come all the time and they want uh, a minimal incision or, or a scarless operation or they want a non-surgical solution um, or, or, a, or a treatment that's gonna give a surgical result. That is rarely, if ever, possible. Um, and I've been at this for a while. I mean, Botox uh, will soften a muscle the same way uh, we used to when we would you know, intentionally um, uh, either sever the nerve or damage the muscle directly. Uh, that's about as close as I can imagine in terms of comparing a, a, a minimally invasive or minimal incision type uh, procedure to, um, to surgery. By the way, uh, you didn't ask, but, the, but let's, let's talk for a minute. I'm old enough to remember when they were debating minimal incision versus minimal, um, minimal access. Um, or minimally invasive. Uh, you know, if I, uh, if we can imagine, oh wait, I have, a, I have a pen. So if I take a pen, if I take a pen and I, and I push this between somebody's ribs, hard to imagine that that's minimally invasive, right? Um, minimal incision, yes, but minimally invasive. And I think one of the reasons that people um, gravitate to, to minimally invasive is it, it maybe just feels safer or feels, and, and it's just, it's a mistake uh, that that was allowed to, uh, to perpetuate. Minimal incision, okay, you're just doing the work through a smaller incision, but, but you're doing whatever it is you're doing underneath the skin. In my business, more often than not, skin is the issue, and we have yet to discover or see a reliable, a device that can shrink skin reliably across all skin types and all age categories um, that, that, that works. Uh, a lot of advertising that says there's devices out there, but I assure you, if there was a device out there, we would all own it. That company would be bigger than Amazon overnight. And not one of us, not one of us would go and do four, five, six, 10 hour surgeries, whatever the case may be, with lots of cutting and sewing. Instead, we would just use this magic wand. Doesn't exist yet. Maybe someday, uh, who knows? Why is it risky to fly to a different country to get plastic surgery? Well, on a couple levels. Uh, flying after plastic surgery is an increased risk for, for blood clots and some other things, but, but practically speaking, um, and, and by the way, people, not another country, but people fly to see us. And I'm, I'm, I'm equally uh, flattered as I am baffled about how that happens. We're, we're, you know, it's great. We, we enjoy looking after patients. But at the end of the day, my, my question to these patients is always you know, somewhat similar. Um, if something goes off the rails or it's not what we want and you're back home, how do I help you through that versus if you live next door or you're in the neighborhood? 
So I think one of the biggest concerns, especially when people go out of the country, number one, is, is the follow-up, which is all but non-existent. The next thing is, um, if you're flying home to wherever you're from and you're familiar with the, the medical community and the medical standards and the licensing and certifications and all of that, that's a perfectly reasonable choice. There are amazing surgeons all over the world. However, what we see in this practice most commonly is that people have gone out of the country for one reason and one reason only, and that is price. They've gone uh, someplace else because it was cheaper. That was their deciding uh, factor. And then um, they are all too often disappointed with their results and they come back either um, sick or, or, or really you know, in, in, uh, in bad shape or, or they just didn't get what they wanted and with little to no follow-up. And that, I think that's the hardest part about traveling out of the country for, uh, and you, know, you just don't know what you're getting because you don't, uh, you know, again, unless you're familiar with, with how they have themselves set up. Can I get a breast reduction at 14 years old? Yes, so for many years, I was a staff plastic surgeon at the Shriners Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. Um, in this regard, age is a number. So at, at the end of the day, uh, there are uh, young women whose breasts begin to develop at an extremely young age, and they can become uh, quite uh, large, you know, enormous, uh, very distracting for these children, and it's distressing. And so um, the, the fundamental difference between that conversation versus uh, someone in the age of maturity is, is really the future of, of breastfeeding, of, of intimacy, of those kinds of concepts that really maybe haven't hit that that child's uh, uh, frame of reference or, uh, or radar yet. And so of course you're engaging with the family and the parents to make sure that they understand as much as possible and then you, you, know, you do what's in the best interest of, of all parties. But, but a breast reduction uh, can be performed at, at any age where the breasts are, are large enough that it's causing you know, similar problems to, uh, to what we see in adults. Are breast lift and breast augmentation the same? No. Um, so you can take all of breast surgery, you can divide it into two main buckets, right? You can have um, position problems and solutions and volume problems and solutions. So position is uh, breast is too low, to the side, to whatever, and you want it moved. By definition, that's going to be a position operation, most commonly a lift. Um, a volume issue, breast is too small, uh, so we're going to make it larger, most commonly with an implant. Sometimes uh, breast is too big and the person wants it smaller and lifted at the same time, commonly referred to as a breast reduction or a, or a lift in that scenario. Well, in keeping with that, uh, maybe the next question, uh, can you produce a lift with an implant? Uh, yes, but most often than not, no. So yes, by putting volume in, you do give a little upward mobility to the breast mound, but more often than not, at least in the patients that we see, uh, they've had kids, they put miles on the car, they're a little bit older, the skin has sagged, and things have really gone south. And so that implant, even an exceptionally large implant, is unlikely to produce that, that more youthful breast position, um, which is why we'll often talk about uh, the implant and the, um, and, and, the, uh, and the lift. And there goes our, our uh, local fire and police department down the street. Okay, next. How to prevent breast augmentation surgery from looking fake? Oh, yeah, well, um, at the end of the day, if, if you've been uh, flat chested all your life and you're skinny as a rail and all of a sudden you come out and, and uh, yeah, uh, it's hard. Uh, at the end of the day, we tell patients how big or small they look to the world around them has more to do with how they dress than the actual size of their breasts. So if you like tight-fitting outfits and push-up bras and plunging necklines, you're gonna look a lot bigger than if you like uh, sports bras and loose-fitting sweaters or sweatshirts and that kind of thing. Um, now, in terms of, of surgical maneuvers, I tend to recommend putting implants under the muscle for, for three reasons. One, it will soften the transition, sorry, I covered my microphone, it'll, it'll soften the transition from the chest wall to the breast implant combination. Two, it will conceal a lot of what would be visible rippling, especially in the parts of the uh, fabric or garment that, that is often exposed and the skin that's often exposed. And then the third reason, not covered with this, but it, it has to do with, with mitigating the risk of capsular contracture. If you have implants, you're at risk for having a capsular contracture. We can talk about that if it's another question, uh, but the data says under the muscle, uh, lowers the risk uh, when the risk can be lowered. Should I see multiple plastic surgeons for consultation before choosing one? Um, it depends on, it, that has to do with your personal um, composition and how you think about things and how you make decisions. Um, th these are, even the smallest operation, um, the surgeon often forgets it's a big decision for you. Uh, we do this day in and day out and it's our bread and butter, but for you it's a big decision and if it helps to see more than one, then by all means see more than one. That said, if you visit with a board certified 
a plastic surgeon, so someone that's board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgeons. They have the knowledge and skill set to do the particular operation that you're interested in. They have the knowledge and skill set to manage the complications that are commonly associated with that particular procedure, and you like them, that's a win. You know, so in that regard, you may not need to go uh, for other visits. But um, I guess it comes down to why you would be seeking other opinions. Is it, is it that you just didn't hear what you wanted to hear? Or is it that you're looking for a better price? Is it, you know, but when you do go, try to compare apples to apples. Great question. Are breast implants safe? Yes. Uh, so there's, there is, um, you know, there, there's roughly, uh, depending on what study you're looking at, uh, let's say three to 400,000 implant related cases in the United States alone, roughly every single year. And the breakdown is about 25% goes to the reconstruction side of life and the rest go to the, uh, the cosmetic side of life. It's a lot of implants over a huge number of years. Um, to date, uh, really the only thing that would be considered bad um, is there is a rare, 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 rare times 10 more rares form of breast cancer associated with a particular textured implant. Uh, we don't use uh, textured implants in the practice, um, but, but it's out there. Um, and even that, uh, the symptoms will predate the cancer by a, a huge um, time frame so that it's not the kind of thing where you're really in jeopardy off the bat. Um, there are um, a growing number of concerns about implants and how it makes people feel. At the moment, there is no significant scientific data linking that implant with those set of symptoms, um, but there are patients who benefit from having their implants removed. Uh, we just can't uh, medically and scientifically causally connect those two uh, events. Patients get frustrated with me when they come and seek a consultation about removing implants, and my response is often the same. It's, you know, I'm, I'm as happy to take them out as I am to put them in. Uh, they have to understand the consequence to the soft tissue envelope, meaning the breast tissue that remains behind once that volume and the implant is removed. And last but not least, there's a, a possibility that removing the implant will not resolve their, their symptoms. Just as I tell my breast reduction patients that a smaller uh, breast may not resolve the symptoms that bring them to see me in the first place. Uh, it doesn't mean the operation can't be done and done well, just those two events may not be completely connected in all people all the time. But yes, breast implants are extremely safe. What is the right age for a breast augmentation? Right, so um, going back to my time at the Shriners, um, we had young women that were born where one breast wouldn't develop. And so we've used uh, tissue expanders uh, that I've placed at the, at the time the other breast starts to grow. So that would be considered a, a, you know, a form of breast augmentation. So we continue the expansion until that, that breast, the other breast is leveled off and then swap it out for an implant. And if that's at you know, 12 to 15, that, that, that's the age range. In general, um, in this practice at least, we're seeing the majority of our patients um, 18 and up. Uh, if you're under 22 in the United States, you're getting a saline implant. If you're over 22, you're getting a silicone. There are some exceptions to that, typically congenital, meaning birth-related deformities and differences. Um, but that's, that's it in a nutshell. Is breast augmentation a one-time procedure? That breast augmentation is a one-time procedure, but that's the only aspect of it that's a, that's a permanent thing. In other words, um, breast implants are not lifetime devices. At some point in your life, they will fail or cause uh, grief or some uh, need to replace. And typically, as we talked about earlier in the video, that, that, that's, that's within a 10-year frame, although if your implants are 15 or 20 years old and, and you're still loving them and they're in shape, then, then that's perfect. Can a breast augmentation be done with local anesthesia? <laughs> Um, years and years ago, I had the opportunity to observe a surgeon uh, do a breast dog under local, um, probably one of the more horrific things I think I've seen. Um, it's not how I would want mine done. It's not how I would recommend my patients have it done. I suppose if you were just going to put it um, on top of the muscle and you weren't going to do any of the other things that we typically do, you could get away with it. But that's an awful lot of, of local medicine that you're putting in someone. And, and honestly, I can't think of a good reason to do it that way. Um, we work with board certified anesthesiologists. Um, your comfort in it being a, 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 as much of a pleasant experience as possible is, is really you know, a, a very important thing to, to, to us here in the practice, me in particular. And so safety, security, um, and, and just having it be a good experience. I, I think people often will do things under local for cost reasons and, and that uh, to me at least is, uh, while I understand, uh, doesn't necessarily jive with the best outcomes and the most comfortable patients. Is Botox considered plastic surgery? 
Well, it depends what you, I mean, we use Botox for um, headaches where we may uh, put it in someone's uh, jaw if they grind their teeth and produce headaches. We use it for sweating, either of the palms or the armpits. We use it for all sorts of non-cosmetic uh, applications, again, referencing the Shriners Hospital. And then when I was at Temple University in Philly, we'd use it for, for Raynaud's disease. That's a, that's a vascular disorder of the fingertips to improve blood flow. Uh, we use it for spastic disorders. And of course, we use it for uh, cosmetic purposes to, uh, to soften uh, muscles of facial expression would probably be the most common thing. Um, I don't know that I would um, particularly say that that's a plastic surgery procedure, but it's something that, that plastic surgeons are, are often uh, associated with. What's the future of plastic surgery? Awesome. Um, if, uh, if Dr. Steve Cohen is listening, hi. Um, I, I think our understanding of how fat is used, especially in facial rejuvenation and other areas of the body, I think uh, genetics and, and genetic based treatments are probably going to change a lot about how we do things. I think um, energy devices will probably get better over time, but there will be some uh, limitation that they'll hit. But I really think the future of plastic surgery is going to be in educating consumers and patients about what it means to be board certified in plastic surgery. There's lots of different boards out there and that, that creates confusion. I think trying to parse out what's real versus what's filtered and, and, uh, and, and just just marketing garbage, I'm sorry to say. Um, and, and then keeping to our core values in plastic surgery about, um, you know, I, I, don't, I won't operate on everybody. Um, I won't, you know, just do something because someone's gonna, gonna pay me to do it. You know, it, it has to be right for the person and, and it has to be something that we can do safely. Um, I think you'll see more and more uh, surgeons, you know, approach it that way, I hope. What is your most favorite procedure to perform? I, you know, I'm fortunate. I have, uh, as many of you know, I have two jobs. I have what I do here in private practice, and I'm uh, fortunate to be the chief of plastic surgery at the VA. Um, so I still have uh, my hands literally and figuratively in both the cosmetic and the reconstructive aspect of the practice. Um, I, I, it, it brings me great joy to see patients happy with, with what we do for them, whether it be a functional operation or an aesthetic operation, um, marrying uh, decades of, of practice and, and training and skill sets and personality and all that to, to, to deliver the good, so to speak, is, uh, is kind of what drives me. What do you recommend, saline or silicone? If you're under 22 and there's, and there's no um, congenital reason to consider uh, silicone, it's gonna be saline. If you're above 22, I think, I think the trend it speaks pretty clearly that most folks are electing to have, um, have silicone implants. Uh, for the record, uh, implants are two-part devices. There's the shell, that's the part that you most commonly physically touch and what's touching your tissue. And then there's stuff that it's filled with. When someone says saline or silicone, what they most commonly mean is what it's filled with. Um, but the shell of all of those implants are silicone. Do I need to get a mammogram before implants? No. So if you're in mammogram territory, meaning you're 40, and in this practice, basically, if you're um, above 35, I will uh, get, get a mammogram before we proceed to, to, to surgery. I was a general surgeon, I'm board certified in general surgery, uh, was board certified in general surgery, and um, they didn't take it away. I just didn't, I don't uh, keep up with my maintenance verification in, the, in general surgery, I do in plastic surgery, of course. Um, and I can tell you, it, it just, it wouldn't feel right uh, to take someone for an elective aesthetic operation and then God forbid find out that they had something uh, on a future study. Uh, so for me, I mean, if there's family history or some other reason, we, you know, we'll go even lower than that in terms of the age. But typically, if you're uh, 35, 36 and above, and you've never had one, um, in addition to the exam we perform here in the office, I've set you up for a mammogram. It's a relatively easy study. What is the recovery time for a mommy makeover? Well, lots of things go into being a mommy makeover. So if you're a mom and you're having plastic surgery, that's a mommy makeover, whatever it may be. But generally speaking, we're talking about breast and belly. Um, what we're getting into is, is the, the belly is going to be the slow uh, portion of it. It takes about 12 weeks in my hands for an abdominoplasty to heal. What I mean by that when I say my hands is that in the hernia literature, it's abundantly clear that the fascia takes about 12 weeks to fully uh, heal. And even then, it's not 100% strength, but that's when I'll let people go back. Why we think it's anything different when we're just tying the muscles together as we do in a tummy tuck, I don't know. But there are plenty of surgeons that tell patients that they can, they can go back earlier. Um, 12 weeks for us. For the breasts, especially if we're going under the muscle, it's six weeks. So typically six weeks um, if you're just doing breasts to get you back into the gym and 12 weeks if we're doing your belly uh, back into the gym. What is a monsplasty? So the area um, below your belt line in a woman is the mons. And it is 
for whatever reason, often overlooked in the tummy tucks that we see, especially from other practices. And so a mons plasty, plasty is basically if you're gonna do anything to change the appearance of whatever it happens to be. Hand plasty, in this case, mons plasty. And so it's a three-dimensional structure. Liposuction uh, is not gonna help. In fact, it's gonna help, it's gonna cause it to hang more. Pulling your tummy tuck tighter and tighter is often not going to help. You're just gonna bring that three-dimensional structure up above where it's supposed to be. And so you, you have to physically um, reduce it in bulk. Um, I do that by taking two small wedges out of the, each side, or one wedge on each side, um, which will allow the mons to then lay more flat and in the same shape and, and, uh, and contour line as the rest of the belly. Can gender fluid people get breast implants? Anyone can get a breast implant. Um, depending on the, the nature of the consultation, if this is a transitioning or transgendering patient, um, there are WPATH guidelines uh, that, that do um, uh, guide the decision-making process and there are certain criteria that have to be followed and that's what we follow here uh, in our practice. Is plastic surgery a sin? <gasps> is it a sin? Boy, I hope not or I'll be out of business. Um, while I acknowledge there are probably people out there that think it is, um, at the end of the day, I don't really have an, you know, an ideological opposition to anyone who uh, decides that there's some aspect of their, their body or their life that they'd like to see better or like to see return to what it was before, um, whether that's someone who injured their hand and wants hand function or whether it's someone that, that wants hand rejuvenation. At the end of the day, um, it's a skill set that, that we have and, uh, and can employ to help patients in their journey to being their best selves. So as long as it's a reasonable uh, patient, reasonable expectation, and a technical surgery that I can deliver, uh, boy, I sure hope it's not a sin. It's a blessing that I get to do it um, with these patients and they trust us with their care. That, that's one of the fascinating and amazing things about plastic surgery. Do breast implants save you from drowning? Um, I'm sure there's a Baywatch joke there somewhere along the line, but no, um, the, the buoyancy of the implant is not gonna, uh, in and of itself, keep you from drowning. That's like, when, when I used to do more hand surgery, you'd be rolling back to the operating room and someone say, Doc, when I get out of this, am I gonna be able to play the piano? And you say, well, could you play the piano before? Yeah, anyway. What happens if a surgeon fails their boards? Um, I, I, I know and have known uh, many, many um, very talented surgeons that uh, have uh, failed an exam. Um, in fact, there are very few people who have gone this far in life that haven't failed something. At the end of the day, um, you fail, so to become a board certified plastic surgeon, there's, there's really uh, a couple, of, there's the training, and there's a, followed by a written exam, and if you pass your written exam, you are then eligible for what's called the oral exam or the certifying exam. I have, I've been fortunate enough in the past to be a, a guest examiner as part of that process. If you were to fail your exam, um, you, re, you retake the exam. Um, if you fail your exam repeatedly, that's a different process. And so let's assume for the moment that, that someone has failed it once, they went back, they took the exam, they passed it, they had a bad day. It's, it's, it's one of the harder exams that you'll ever encounter, one of the more stressful exams you'll ever encounter. So I don't, in and of itself, think that's a problem. Um, someone that, that never passes their exam, that's a different story. Now, when I was in academic medicine and, and many of the hospitals that I belong to, a requirement is to obtain your board certification within a certain period of time. Uh, so failing the exam could potentially put them at risk for losing their their livelihood or their access to that particular facility. Um, but uh, I hope that answers whoever wrote that question. What are you tired of explaining when it comes to plastic surgery? I like explaining it all. In fact, as you well know, because you've sat through um, too many consultations with me, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to explain it. I think the hardest part um, is, is either a, a price conversation that, that's always challenging because at the end of the day, there's always someone that'll do it cheaper. Um, and, and then really the, the, uh, the unrealistic expectations. You know, the people that, that read something, they heard something, they, they quote unquote did their research and, and what it was is they did a, a YouTube video or something along the lines that just uh, reinforces what they already thought. Those, those are hard days, right? When you have to try to get someone to believe that, you know, after two decades and three different uh, uh, surgical specialty training and, and, uh, and, and lots and lots of iterations that, that you are in fact um, the expert on this particular topic. Um, and, and by an expert, I mean, I, I, I always have, there's always something else to learn. There's something, you know, every single day we try to learn something new. But I've been doing this a long time and I'm good at what I do. And, uh, and, and I think the hardest part is when you can't connect with the patient, even, even when you think you can help them. Because if I can't connect with them, I, I, I will often uh, refer them elsewhere because I think it's important that you really be able to connect and communicate with your surgeon. Have you gotten anything done?
I'll leave that. I'll, 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 let the, I'll let the viewing audience guess. No, I think I'm far too ugly to have been, uh, uh, to have had any surgery done, no. I, I mean, I, I, think, I mean, I, I mean uh, functional surgery. I broke, broke, broke my hand, broke, you know, broke things along the way. Botox, filler, anything? Nope. My kids often want to know, um, and my residents often encourage me to get Botox so I don't look angry all the time. I say there's a reason um, for that, but a topic for a different video. Why is plastic surgery on the rise? Uh, social media, I think, as um, social media and then some of the bigger stars, uh, you know, pre-social media, you know, when Oprah uh, had some procedures done, I think as more and more celebrities are talking about it, and then as social media has really leveled the playing field to show that, that, that everyday people are getting plastic surgery as well, um, I think that uh, more and more people want, uh, you know, they're, they're looking after themselves, they're trying to, to achieve certain goals, and I think for, for many, many people, plastic surgery fills that need. So I think that's probably why. What is the most high risk surgery that you can perform? I think the highest risk surgery is, is the one the patient doesn't understand. Um, you know, either they, they just don't, um, they don't um, understand the risks, you weren't able to explain it to them, or they, or they choose not to believe it, and so they have an outcome that they weren't expecting, and they, they have a hard time uh, managing or mitigating that. I think that's, that, that's the highest risk. Uh, there are certain surgeries that we do um, where we work around critical structures, whether it's the heart, or the spine, or the brain, um, those are high risk, but, but it's not, uh, we're there because we have to be, because the, 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 the patient has a problem that has to be addressed. So the risk in those scenarios is, is more along the lines of not doing the surgery than, than of what we're doing. How common is breast implant rejection? Um, it's not a thing. I mean, you can, there really is no such thing as, as, as someone rejecting, like we talk about rejecting a, uh, a transplanted organ, there's no such thing as a rejected uh, implant. Uh, rather, you know, you can form a capsule around it, you can have wound complications, you can have wound infections, you can have the need for it to be removed, um, but um, I've, I've, I've never heard of someone, uh, quote unquote, rejecting an implant. How long does breast implant exchange surgery take? Depends what the issues are. Um, straightforward, someone just wants to change their size and the. Um, the skin envelope is, is, is roughly the same. Um, can be a, a relatively short, straightforward operation. Alternatively, someone that has capsular contracture and a ruptured implant, and they want to downsize and, and then add a lift to that, those can be very, very long days. Um, we do both. Um, happy to discuss what your needs are. I'm a runner. Should I get breast implants? Um, I have uh, done both aesthetic and reconstructive work on uh, marathon runners, and um, you can still be very physically active. Uh, you may choose a narrower, Im narrower implant versus a wider so that your arm is not constantly brushing it, but at the end of the day, uh, you'll need to wear the supportive bra uh, so that it's comfortable to run. Um, we don't see a lot of uh, super long distance runners for that, but, but the ones we do, um, we have those conversations. What was the worst plastic surgery you have ever seen? Um, we routinely see surgeries that come out from other countries um, who fly back home to San Antonio and present with um, really horrendous infections, um, scars in places that would um, uh, baffle me as to uh, you know what the surgeon was thinking, and um, and that's really uh, that's really very hard uh, to see and, and very sad for those patients. Okay, thank you for this episode of Q&A. See you soon. Bye.